Welcome back. What I have here is a semicircle, and you might already know the area for this by some memorized formula. We know the whole circle has area of pi r squared, and therefore a semicircle should have area of 1 half pi r squared. However, how did the first person even come up with pi r squared as the area of a circle? And even though it's something we can look up, it'd be nice if we could understand if there's a technique out there that might be able to solve what area actually means in more context. That way, when we encounter shapes that no one's ever looked at before, we can still describe exactly how many resources are needed to cover that space. How much paint does it take to paint it? Now, textbooks in the internet are full of solutions to this problem, and I consider them all to be somewhat misleading and inappropriate. I'm going to describe them collectively as vague. Let me explain why. So here's the vague idea. What we can do is we can rely on the integration property of area. That is, the whole should be the sum of its parts. So let's cut it up into some parts. If you understand what a circle is, you know that the length of each one of those lines is the same as r. It's the radius of this circle. If we space these out the same way, then each one will be a pizza slice of roughly the same area. We simply move the parts around to make them look more rectangular. Now, you might say that doesn't look very rectangular to you, and you'd be right. But we now realize that we're onto something. If this is close enough to being a rectangle, we can at least approximate it by a rectangle. For example, we could see a rectangle that lives inside or outside of it and measure that part. That would give us an upper or lower bound. An outer bound rectangle would have some knowable area, and we could work out that value. An inside box would be a lower bound. Now we see that these two numbers might not agree. So what we'd like to do is get a better approximation. Here we set up a contest. So now we set up some ground rules that help us chase down this problem. Whether you're a person or a machine, you can't sit around to read every single decimal place. Therefore, there will be some limit at which point you will give up on how accurate it has to be. The first rule we make is that you must declare the accuracy that you want. Once you tell me how accurate you need the area to be, then my job will be to compute it to better than that accuracy. If we agree to these ground rules, then I can actually answer the area of the circle using this method. See, the outside box and the inside box are presently farther apart than they need to be, and we see the reason why. Because these shapes aren't actually flat, they poke out a bit higher than the inside and outside. But I can make them more flat by making smaller pizza slices. By subdividing all of those, I now have 12 pizza slices, and each one of them looks a little bit more triangular. Now the inside and outside rectangles are closer together. This vanishing gap between the outside and the inside is a measurement of how close our precision is. If we keep adding subdivisions and measuring those triangles ever more precisely, we can squeeze that gap to within any number of decimal places that you ask for. At that point, we can take either the inside or the outside as our accurate measurement of that area. What sense is this accurate? Of course, it's not the actual area of the circle, but it's accurate to within the number of decimal places that you declared at the start. In this way, we win our contest. Now, here's where the mathematicians make a conceptual leap. They imagine in their heads an idea of going to infinity. What if we kept slicing thinner and thinner pieces? Eventually, the pieces would be so thin, no one could distinguish that the top is even curved. And if we even reach infinity, we could imagine that's actually an infinite number of these slices with no thickness at all, all stacked together, covering the entire area. Now what would be left would be an exact rectangle, because the angle we have in here keeps shrinking, and it shrinks to zero, because we've cut it up everywhere. Now that this wedge has angle zero, it's perfectly vertical. We have a right angle. We therefore have a rectangle. And we also know the length of this rectangle. We can take the radius on this side, and then we need to work on what the bottom side is. Notice that these pieces are organized top and bottom, so there's half as many on the bottom as there are on the top. Since we're taking a semicircle of radius r, we have half the circumference. Therefore, on the top, we have a quarter of the circumference and a quarter on the bottom. So the total area is the product of those two numbers, which is pi over 2 r squared. Now comes the real trouble. If we really embrace this idea of going to infinity and taking that triangle and shrinking it to an absolute zero, then they're all thickness zero. I mean, you could stack them together and they would just contract to nothing. Why should they fill up a space at all? That's the first question we might have. The second question is, what if those little ripples on the top are still there? Maybe you just can't see them. I'll confess a bias. I prefer to think of limits as a calculation tool, whereas some mathematicians will actually profess that they think of this thing reaching an infinite point. Something happened in their imagination. I'm not completely sure that I can say they're wrong. I'm not in their imagination. But I can tell you that you don't have to imagine infinity to be able to do a limit. Most of these arguments are heuristic ways to work around the details of what's really going on. 
But I want to warn you that it's a mistake to skip the details. You can really draw a picture that convinces you of something that's entirely false. Let's do that next. I want you to imagine a taxi driving in a city. This city is on a perfect green. What the taxi driver has to do is take us from this street corner to that street corner. The only rule is that the taxi driver cannot break the rules of the road. They must stay on the road. So let's imagine what their shortest path is. The taxi driver could continue straight until they need to turn and then go up. If they do this, it takes them one, two, three, four blocks. Well, let's try another path. Suppose they go north first and then to the east. It's still four blocks. Trying out a few other paths, we might go through the middle of the city. Once more, it's still four units. No matter what way you do, unless you make a detour and have to backtrack, you will take exactly four blocks to get to your destination. It seems to be unrelated to the actual turns we take. Now let's imagine this on a very large city. In my very large city, I still have the same goal. You need to travel from this corner all the way to that corner. The logic of the system hasn't changed. I have to stay on the roads. Now, I could just drive around the outside. Or I could try to take some paths in the middle. Now, I could get in there and count all the little blocks, but I can already tell something's happened, and I'll use this stick to compare it. From corner to corner, it takes one full stick. And already here, it's used up most of the stick, leaving us just the handle. If we take just the handle, we're nowhere near reaching our endpoint. This diagonal path has somehow managed to be shorter than the outside path. So what really changed? At this point, I want to caution you that what has happened is not mathematics. It's a failure of eyesight. There is no difference between the logic over here and the logic over here. It is simply that we decided to pass to an approximation in a place where we can't approximate. And this is the fundamental flaw in thinking like a calculus student. The failure here is a failure to count. If we actually get in here and count all the little blocks that we visit, we will discover that the pink line has exactly the same distance as the yellow line for exactly the same reasons that it happened over here. This is what's known as the taxi cab distance. And yet something must be wrong. Surely it's much easier to walk across a football field on the diagonal than it is to walk around the sides. What's going on here? There are two ways you might approach explaining this. One is you can deny the idea that length is an integral structure. That is, it's not necessarily the sum of its parts. But there's no mathematics that backs that up. The more likely scenario is that you're being fooled by your eyes. To appreciate what's going on, we need to rotate our picture a little bit. Here's a curve that our taxi cab took in this process. And here's another one. We see that folding this triangle up, we get the exact same length. Likewise, we could take this yellow line and start folding in all those pieces and rotating them in until we match the pink line. That's a proof that they are in fact the same length. There is no advantage for a taxi cab taking a shortcut along the diagonal. However, the mistake came when I did this. Because what I did here is I held up something that was on the true diagonal and I claimed that it was an approximation of the pink line. When I compared it to a stick, I was measuring the distance from this point to this point, but I was claiming it was the same thing as these pink lines that move from side to side. We can see now that in fact, there's a little bit more distance in between these. Just for comparison, here's another path I could take and it would trace out that path. Notice they're always connecting these two endpoints. Now seeing them together like this, you might think that the green line is longer than the pink line. Again, this is an optical illusion. It's not mathematically different. And we can see that because we could start to unwrap some of these pink corners. I've just flipped up those two corners. Now I'll flip up that corner. See, we're starting to get closer and closer to the green line, and we haven't affected the length of the pink string. Once we unfold this process, we'll see that in fact these two strings have the same length. But notice what this is not saying. We are not saying that the distance between these two points is represented by those two lengths. The distance between those two points is the line that's shortest between them. 
our ability to take a distance which is unrelated to this white line and fold it up intricately to look ever and ever closer to our white line is what can lead you into a misunderstanding of calculus. Mathematicians know this, and they have names for this kind of function. They would say that a piece of string tightly coiled up around a white line that seems to approximate it but isn't actually the same length does not have bounded variation. And this is exactly what's happening in the pie chart picture. See, when we imagine that we can reach infinity, we give ourselves some shortcuts. We imagine that there is this concept of somehow squeezing the air completely out of that pizza joint, getting to a zero volume, and turning a curved shape into a flat shape. But that is simply an optical illusion. It's similar to this. So let's walk through it again. Imagine if we stack up our pizza slices interlaced like this, and then we put ourselves in a position of imagining, like some space creature, that we can go to infinity. Once we get to that infinity, we imagine that we somehow created that pizza slice with a zero angle in between and flat on top, and that somehow magically adding up an infinite number of them is some kind of area. But this is not supported by any scientific process nor mathematical. This is just simply an imaginary thing that mathematicians tell each other in order to get by. The real explanation is the one we gave at the beginning. There is an outside box and an inside box, and we're making those two measures get more and more close to each other. We're making an approximation better and better over time. We're never actually reaching infinity. We're just improving that measurement. If that logic were solid, then we should be able to take an infinite grid in the city and make an infinite sequence of north and east turns to get a perfect approximation along the diagonal. And yet we know that at no place was the length ever changing from the outside length. This would be saying that the hypotenuse is no shorter than the sum of the two sides, which is simply not true. So something has to give. What people are selling you with this picture is completely made up heuristics to try to get you to understand the basic concept. This immediately refutes it. In my book, you should give up on the concept of arriving at infinity. Instead, you should think of a limit as simply getting a better and better approximation. And you should write down what you are approximating. We already did this. What we were approximating wasn't the final shape at all. What we were approximating was the gap between the inside rectangle and the outside rectangle. If we keep shrinking that gap, then we can always make a more precise measurement of this process. And we might even be able to predict how that air will eventually become so faint that we can just round the rest of it off to zero, giving us a precise formula. For example, since this is still the radius, I can say that whatever this shape is, is peaking out some amount. And so that length is a little bit more than the radius. And also the length up here is about a quarter of the circumference because half the circumference is the total of those two sides. But I'll give myself a plus or minus a margin of error to allow for those extra humps. So here's more accurately what we've done. We've said that we will work out the area as, as one half pi r squared plus or minus the number of decimal places that you declare at the beginning to be accurate. But here's the upside. Because you get to choose the air, you could always make it larger. And therefore, my formula better be precise enough that when you make it larger, I can update my air. Once you update to more precision, I will have to drop my air term. I can see where this is going. You just make your E bigger and bigger and bigger, and I still have to get my air smaller and smaller than that amount. The conclusion is clear. If I want a formula that I'll never have to update based on anyone's future air, I should just drop the air completely and call the formula what it is without the air. The limit process is about taking the mathematical formula that measures what we actually want to talk about and letting the air become zero. By doing this formula, we're guaranteed to always satisfy the, the rules of the game. You could change your air term, and my solution will always be better than that air. This is the concept of taking a limit. Notice this has no associated picture to go with it. We simply can't make consistent arguments about cutting up a circle into infinitely many places and reassembling them into this rectangle. This taxicab distance will serve as a warning that that takes special mathematics to do correctly, and it's generally not what we're trying to teach in the calculus class. And before this gets misunderstood, I am not saying that you can't walk across the diagonal of a football field faster than the other sides. I'm simply saying that walking along the diagonal is not the same as only going north and east an infinite number of times. It's a different path altogether. So, for my money, you should think of the limit as simply a mathematical abstraction that says, nothing got to infinity, but I can make my air as small as you like, and once I know how to make my air as small as I want, I will set my air to be zero as the final formula. If I can do that, I've satisfied the properties of my limit. So let's put what we learned in a box. What we're trying to describe is what's formally known as a limit. Here we have a process that might depend on a counter. For example, this could be the number of pizza slices of our semicircle, or it could be the number of grid points in our taxicab norm. 
We say that the limit of f of n as n approaches infinity equals L whenever we've achieved the following. For e decimal places of accuracy, the value L that we're giving as our limit is within e decimal places of the actual value of f of n. Now that won't be true for all values of n. Our first approximation of the pizza pieces was not a very good approximation, but we eventually made it better. So all we need is for this approximation to be true for all but finitely many values of n. We can throw out the initial cases that didn't work out too well. Once we know that for all but finitely many of them, we get within this precision, we know that eventually everyone will come up with the same limit L. Once more, we are never saying that f actually reached infinity. There is no f of infinity, and so there's no need to actually have l be the outcome of whatever that is. We're simply saying that because we can't tell the difference up to any accuracy that someone chooses, we may as well set it equal to the l and not worry about it from here on out. Now that we have this concept of limit, let's put it together with what we've learned about area. Our area began with the concept of a rectangle having area length times width, change in y times change in x. And the reason we chose that is that the algebra distributes over addition. So once we know it's an integral structure, that is, the whole of the sum of its parts, we can start to subdivide into other rectangles and add them up to get the total area. The trouble was, not every shape conveniently works out into rectangles. So instead, we approximate it by shoving rectangles inside in some way that get better and better approximations. And we'll see many more of that in future videos. However, we saw with something like the semicircle, that we could never actually get it completely with rectangles. The best we could do was approximate it on the outside and the inside by approximately the same areas. But that approximation had the quality that it had a limit. For any accuracy that was desired, we could get to within that many decimal places. Since that worked for any accuracy, we just eventually erase the decimal places and call the limit the final answer. When we put area together with a limit, we give it a special name so that we know that it's calculated with this property. It's called the integral. The notation is a big curly S for sum, and we keep the values a and b on the side to remind us of the total change of x. Because this dx is an ever-changing thickness, because the triangle pieces kept shrinking, we can't say this is one definitive length. Rather, it's a formula that tells us how to rewrite the length each time we need a better approximation. So instead of calling it delta x, we change it to the letter dx. Finally, the function y tells us how high up to go to build the right rectangle to fit in there. This is representative of actually one of many possible choices for computing that actual area. You could divide the same shape up into rectangles in many different ways. They should all give you the same answer. The reason they have to give you the same answer is that once a limit exists, then it's talking about something that's accurate up to a number of decimal places. If you have two different methods, you could always make them agree on the same number of decimal places, and in that sense, you couldn't tell them apart. Once you can't find any number difference between them, then it makes no sense to talk about them as different. So. So while this doesn't quite describe one specific sum, because we can subdivide in many ways, it still describes the same total area, and therefore it's a great way to measure. Standing back to look at this, you might start to wonder something new. Notice that area is based on multiplication. And one of the things we often find is that we have an equation of the form a equals bx. That is, we have multiplication with an unknown value. Whenever we have that, we solve for the unknown using division. So, it might be possible to think of an analog for area that uses division as the main measurement. And if there's a division analog, then we could combine that with limits and create an analog of division and limits together. And those should be, in some ways, reciprocal of each other. And if they are reciprocals, so that would be a powerful theorem. But that'll wait for a future video. Until next time. That's how you take care of your chalkboard.